uh, I think you can look at the private sector from two separate angles. The first is having sustainable profits moving forward. And the second one is, of course, protecting against reduction in profits because of things like business interruption. Business interruption could mean lost productivity days because people can't get to work. It could mean lost productivity because of supply chain interruption. It could mean increased expenses, insurance premiums, et cetera, et cetera. So businesses are just as exposed to climate change as individuals, as communities, as the environment. And we provide them with a platform, both at a federal and a state level, to have their voices heard. There are 14 million small, medium-sized enterprises in the United States. The large corporations are generally well taken care of by organizations like Ceres, Future 500, and others. And Corporate Climate Alliance actually goes to DC. It goes to state legislators and lobbies on behalf of businesses to help fight climate change. So two things I think I would say about that. The first is that there's an old saying that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. The Iron Age didn't end because we ran out of iron, and so forth and so on. We're now coming to the end of the Industrial Age, or some people call it the Hydrocarbon Age, the Fossil Fuel Age, and that won't end because we run out of fossil fuels. It will end because human innovation and technology finds a better way, just as it did from the other ages that we migrated from and into. So we're looking over the next 30 to 50 years at the end of the fossil fuel era anyway, regardless if there was climate change or not. The second is how do you get more investment into renewable energy? Uh, Senator Coons from Delaware and Senator Moran from Kansas have sponsored a bill that's going to go on the floor this year as part of a bigger tax bill, but so be it will still be in there, that is a master limited partnership bill in the 80s um, there was a bill put through that allowed incredibly favorable tax treatments for people who invested in hydrocarbons, mainly in um, oil and gas exploration and drilling. But, but be that as it may, the tax benefits were there, and those master limited partnerships are still in place today. The bill that's being proposed to the floor or taken to the floor opens up that to renewable energy. So now it becomes a level playing field. So that investors in green energy, if you want to call it that, or clean or renewable energy, will get the same prefer preferential tax treatments that people that invest in hydrocarbons do. Um, so that will result, we believe, in a tsunami of investment flowing into renewable energy. What does that generally do? It generally increases the rate at which technology advances which, as we all know from looking at just flat-screen TVs, what happens to the price? It comes way down. So we have that on our side. There's one final thing that may be not quite so intuitive, which is that we've migrated from, from a, a, a society of consciousness to one of common sense. So in 1993, if I had given you $10,000 and said, would you like to invest it in coal or renewable energy? you probably would have said, I'll invest it in coal because I'll get a higher return. I would have then had to leverage your conscience to try and get you to invest that in renewable energy. If I asked you the same question today, where would you invest that $10,000? Green. Out of common sense, not necessarily out of consciousness. There's two things that, that really we need to focus on climate change. One is mitigation. That is a global issue. Uh, as a singular community or a singular country, and you can even take it down to a hyper-local level, we can only play our part in the mitigation strategies that are required to slow down climate change. Whether it's man-made or not, all the evidence tells us that we're in the middle of a change of climate, and it's happened hundreds of times before. The last one was 10,000 years ago with the Ice Age. If we had the Ice Age today, we could lose a third of our population of the planet. So we can decide whether to, mit to, to participate in mitigation strategies or not based upon our political and, in some cases, don't really want to go there, but religious beliefs. But mitigation is a global issue. 
resiliency is a very local issue because different geographic locations are going to be affected by different types of changes to the climate. Sea level rise, of course, is prevalent and very concerning in the low country. They call it the low country for a reason. If you go to Utah, sea level rise is probably not going to be as concerning, but you will have other issues. So, so localized communities own their own resiliency. Resiliency, therefore, is not necessarily at the federal level, like mitigation is. Resiliency is more at the local level, whereas the low country and, 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 and populations in the low country and environments in the low country need to now think about infrastructure and guarding against sea level rise. Communities in Utah would think about something else, which brings us to a point that, again, is not necessarily intuitive. Climate change has risks, rewards, and trade-offs. What's a reward of climate change? Communities like Savannah that need increases in employment, if you're going to build a true resiliency program through infrastructure, that means billions of dollars in investment in infrastructure. That increases the velocity of capital in this community and leads to a great increase in the number of jobs. So some people will argue that there is a reward to climate change. There's a benefit to communities if they participate. And so that can oftentimes balance out what's going on at the federal level. Uh, realistically, when you look at, uh, let's take communities that fell on very, very hard times, not necessarily because of climate change, but, but because of, of uh, issues that caught up with them. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I'm not picking on Pennsylvania, believe me, but uh, Detroit, Michigan, the country of Wales, where, where, where I was born, uh, where with a stroke of a pen in 1979, Margaret Thatcher ended the coal industry. Many of those communities enjoyed uh, a rapid increase in the velocity of capital and therefore the livelihood of the people that live within those communities over a period of time. Those communities then stagnated, the velocity of capital stagnated, and unfortunately started turn that, turning down the other way and, and reducing until it got to a stage where those communities were past the point of no return, and many of them, as we know, became destitute. Climate change has the potential to do that to communities. It has the potential to wreak so much havoc on the velocity of capital that's found within a community, which is, we're talking to economics here, that it will decrease it to such a level that that community just cannot come back. It's on the precipice. It goes over the precipice. It cannot come back. That is a severe uh, example, but it can happen. We're seeing the first community in the United States was that, that actually had to be moved because of climate change was in Louisiana last year. They had to move the entire community. So that's at one end of the spectrum. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, take a city like Charleston. In the 70s, Charleston got flooded on average four times a year. Last year, it was 34 times. 34 days of business interruption, potentially 34 days of supply chain interruption, 34 days of potential uh, lack of revenues from tourism. The result of the fact that that can be insurance premiums going up, the cost of business going up. So anytime you have decreases in revenues and increases in expenses, generally not good. So those are the types of economic effects that we could see of climate change. Well, you're going to take me a little bit off tangent here. And I'm going to t say that the problems in the United States are not down here with the people. They're up there in Washington, D.C. Um, I think that the politicians, whether they are Republican and Democrat, have done an amazing job of dividing and conquering us. And while they can keep all the problems down here with us, what does that mask? It masks the real problem, which is them. And we have leadership that blatantly lie to us. And I'm not just talking about Donald Trump. We have leadership that will avoid answering questions that are important to the very people that put them in Washington, D.C. 
we have leadership that continues to cut backroom deals and continues to take special interest money. And it is in their benefit, it is to their benefit to keep us as warring factions underneath. And until that changes, and until we get transparency at the highest level, and we can always have policy disputes. We're not going to agree on different policies, whether you're on the Republican side of the aisle or the Democratic side of the aisle. What we should agree upon, though, is transparency, truthfulness, and accountability at the political level. 